the guys is Friday, January the 7th, 2022. And I've been watching the live stream of the Supreme Court justices deciding today whether or not mandates are constitutional. And what I've heard has disturbed me because they are not doing the job they were called to do. They're giving their own opinions about things. They are not determining whether or not the mandates are constitutional. They're merely talking about the greater good. And um, so it seems to me their minds are made up. We'll see how it goes. The decision's not been handed down yet, but they act as though they're the law of the land. And that once their decision is made, we must abide by it. But they are sorely mistaken. Because there is a higher power that we have access to. <laughs> and I just would, I want to explain some things about the courts of God. I'm going to read you some scripture. And this um, flag that I have in the video flies on our front porch. It's a little tattered. I've had it up for quite some time, <laughs> but I'm going to explain this flag to you and the quote that's behind it and who designed it. And some of this, you know, might inspire some of you to go get this flag for yourself and just remind yourself when you see this flying on your home, that we don't end with the courts of this world. We don't have to abide by Ill illegitimate rulers, mandates. You know this already. But I just want to remind you of these things. And if you can tell, I'm a little fired up. <laughs> um, a little bit about my backstory. And I, I don't really like to talk about this because I know the negative connotation that lawyers have. But I, I'm a lawyer. And I went to law school. And I practiced for a number of years before God called me out of the profession. But that law degree that I have was inspired. And I know God sent me down that path because he was going to show me the significance of his courtroom and how the pattern of our court system in this earth and in our nations was meant to be patterned after his courts. That was the intent to begin with, but it is far strayed, obviously, as everyone can tell from what God intended. But he's coming back to that. And we have an appeal to heaven that these courts are hoping we will not act on. And I, I, I need to encourage you all to take this appeal to the throne of God with confidence. <laughs> we are covered in the blood of his son to approach his throne and make our appeal and beg for mercy of his court. And so one thing that he showed me through this background that I have in, the, in law is that there are two there are two things about the law that are known as the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. The letter of the law is the actual written law. It's what's in our books, on our constitution. But the spirit of the law, that is the intent for which the law was written. Now we know that God has handed down his law to his children we are the citizens of the kingdom of God. And this, this law that he's given us are the laws that we must abide by as his citizens. You may not like the laws of the United States, so you may decide you want to move and go to another country. Well, guess what? You're going to fall under the laws of that country. And if you don't like those laws, you go to another one. You're going to fall under those laws. But we are called out of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And as those citizens... As citizens of his kingdom, he has laws too. And what's interesting to me is in John 4, 24, we're told that God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now we know from the description of our Savior that Yeshua, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. So he is the truth. But what's the spirit that we must worship him in? In spirit and in truth. I believe that's a reference to the law. But not just the letter of the law. The spirit of the law. The intent for which God gave us this law. Which is to restore us and reconcile us back to him. 
to have that relationship with him. The spirit of the law was for intimacy. That's the spirit of the law. We're told over in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, spirit and truth, right there. I believe it is spelled out for us. Keeping the commandments is in part worshiping him in spirit, by the spirit of the law, through intimacy, through that reconciliation back to him. In Yeshua, our faith in Yeshua is the truth. And those two things are irrefutable. So I want to discuss with you today about the courts and how this works. Okay, our court system is supposed to be patterned after the courts of heaven. That was the intent. We have strayed greatly from that intent. But I want you to look over in Job. I think this is, I've always found this story very fascinating. Because starting in chapter 1 of Job, verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. I see this as a courtroom. There was a day set aside when they came to present themselves before the Lord. So let's talk about some courts here for a minute. We know Satan is, is described as our accuser. In modern court settings, that would probably be known as the prosecutor. He's come to bring accusations against God's people. But we have a defender. <laughs> we have Yeshua, Jesus himself, that once the accusations are leveled against us in the courts, Jesus, Yeshua, stands up and says, She is mine. He is mine. I, am, he, I bought that one with my blood. He is our great defender. And right now we know Satan is still there accusing. He has not been cast down yet and will not be until the book of Revelation begins to unfold, which we're seeing happen in real time. But he is still there and all heaven's going to rejoice when he finally gets cast down because I'm pretty sure they're sick to death of him right now. With all of us doing our thing down here, it's just really depressing. Okay, let me go into the courts here. So let's start with Psalm 84. Verse 2, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. We want our day in court. Let's go over to Psalm 84, 10. All right, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Because they're going to get their day in court too. You rest assured. What we think is getting a pass in this world today, God is taking careful notes. Let that encourage you. Psalm 94, verse 13 says, <clears throat> oh wait, let me see, where is that? Psalm 92, I'm sorry, verse 13. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God flourish in the courts of our God. You know, there's a parable Jesus gave about the un, he was a worldly judge. I don't have this in my notes right here, but this just came to mind that that woman that had been persecuted and she was under oppression. She came to that, that court every day petitioning. And that judge, though he was worldly, he got sick of hearing about it and he gave her what she wanted. And Jesus gives us this parable and he says, how be it if this, un, this secular worldly Judge, who didn't fear the Lord, gave this woman what she wanted because she petitioned him both day and night, then how much more would God, being the just judge, give us what we're asking for from him, especially when we come in his, this name of his son? Guys, we've got to really take to heart what we're being told here. There's something about that squeaky wheel. We've got to bring our appeals to heaven. And we've got to be petitioning his court on behalf of all of mankind right now. <sighs> okay, back to the scriptures here. We've got another in Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth 
to all generations. So we must enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. When you come into that courtroom on your face, you fall before him and you thank him for giving you breath, for giving us this day. You praise his holy name and then you make your petitions now and he will hear you. Over in Isaiah chapter one, verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? We are called to tread his courts. We can bring our prayers. That's what our prayers are, our petitions before the court, before our righteous judge, our father. These are the purpose of our prayers. Okay, another Isaiah 62 verse 9. But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. This is his strength and our promise that we have access to his throne, to his courtroom of holiness. We know that's where the great white throne judgment will take place. Okay, we've got another Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 7. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Whew, man, arise and thresh comes to mind. Look over in Zechariah chapter 3 verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou shalt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house. And shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. We're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to help keep his courts. This is amazing information here, and I love it. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is based on what we're told here in Zechariah 3, verse 7. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Starts out with verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now, guys, a lot of this you, you already know. But I just want to remind you that we have access to his courts. We might not be able to come within a hundred feet of the Supreme Court building right now while they're ruling things that will control our lives here. But we have an appeal to a higher court. And we don't need permission by the law of the land to appeal to this higher court. So I'm showing you this flag. It's called an appeal to heaven. <clears throat> and the history behind this flag is fascinating to me. It was used during the American Revolution. It was designed by George Washington's secretary. And it was commissioned by Washington himself as the right of revolution. And this was based on John Locke's Treatise on Civil Government, which was published in 1690. And that treatise refuted the theory of the divine right of kings to rule. Because as you know, any of you that are awake these days know that there are a class of people that think they have the divine right to rule over us. And you see, they're all related. They all claim to be of a certain bloodline and things to that nature. They have they think the right to rule us because this world belongs to Satan right now. If it didn't, he wouldn't have had the authority to offer it to Jesus in the wilderness. Okay, so these people that rule and reign over us here claim that divine right of kings to rule. So here's what that civil treatise said that was published in 1690. This is a long quote, but it's from John Locke. And this is where the, the quote comes from, an appeal to heaven. And where the body of the people or any single man is deprived of their right or is under the exercise of a power without right and have no appeal on earth, then they have a liberty to appeal to heaven whenever they judge the cause of sufficient moment 
And therefore, though the people cannot be judged, here anyway, <clears throat> that's my adding, so as to have by the constitution of that society any superior power to determine and give effective sentence in the case, yet they have by a law antecedent and paramount to all positive laws of men reserved that ultimate determination to themselves which belong to all mankind. All mankind. But I would add those that are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Where there lies no appeal on earth to judge, whether they have just cause to make their appeal to heaven. We may not have access right now to stand before the Supreme Court while they're making their ruling. But we can and must stand before the Lord, come before him in prayer and supplication, making our petitions known to him with confidence, knowing that we are covered by the blood of his son. Through repentance and obedience, we stand boldly before his throne of grace and we make our appeal to heaven. <laughs> and he will make the final determination, not the laws of the land, not the highest courts of this earth, but God himself. So make your appeal known. Fall on your face and you pray out to him. And you say, Father, we see what's happening in this world, but they have no power over yours. Greater is he that is within us than he that is in this world. And let me tell you something. They're terrified. When you get this understanding, they are terrified of us because we have access to the highest courts ever created, not just in the land, but we are citizens of the kingdom of God and we have a right to come before his throne. So you all exercise that right. Let's do this. Take our appeal to heaven. To conclude, I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Has there ever been a more time of need than we are seeing now, where they're making a determination to rule over our own bodies? Make your appeal known. Stand with confidence and cry out to the judge over all the earth and all the heavens, over it all. We have access to his throne, guys. Come boldly before it. Thanks for listening and be blessed.